Hello there, and welcome back to The Disconnected. I'm here with Rich Johnson, who is a writer extraordinaire, audio commentator, contributor to Fangoria, and so much more. Rich, I I'm humbled. Thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. No problem. I don't know if I'm going to live up to everybody else's uh, <laughs> interviews. You've got some great guests on so far. Fantastic. Including your wife, of course. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Uh, funny enough, I just got a comment and uh, I got to bring it up because of your backdrop right now. One of the comments mm. said, you know, it's going to be a good interview when there's a wall of physical media behind them. And what a beauty you got, man. Yeah, this is um, I am in my study stroke library, as my daughter calls it. Um, this is one of two rooms. So you can see one wall at the minute. And literally this room is pretty much every wall except the window and then i've got an archive which all the dvds and everything go into which is like another room right which i fish out stuff and I, I still use you know i still watch my dvds it's just don't obviously i'm quite lucky to have that that space to have everything out so you know that i've been through periods of just sort of tubbing it up and shoving right. it in the, in the attic and Oh, where's that film? Oh, right, okay, it's in tub number forty-two. I'll, I'll just, I'll just grab that out. So now I just put um, some of the repeats in there and things that I'll probably take down to the charity shop every now and again if it's things yeah. that I've got too many of um, repeats and things. Then, well, and with your work, you can tell that you refer back to things because you've got like citations of, uh, you know, in this interview, somebody mentioned this and. A uh, clear example of that, you're mo I, I think this is the most recent published, right? Uh, the newest release of The Changeling? I think it is, yeah. I mean, I think there's been... Crimes of the Future, Future has been put back right. to early September, I think. But yeah, I'm pretty sure The Changeling was, was the last one. That was Wonderful piece on. On, on George C. Scott in there, by the way. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So uh, you, you, you're the one person that, that read that then. That's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do my best to read all of these booklets and I try to encourage everybody to because there's nuggets of wisdom that you pick up and it really helps as you watch through all of this. Yeah, I, I mean, from my point of view, I love, I mean, I love writing about film and a lot of the time the commissions I get, if, especially for that one, I was invited to um, contribute to that, which was amazing because it is right. literally one of my favorite ghost stories. And I'm never one to, even though I know about the film, I'm not complacent enough to think I'm just going to write exactly what's in my head of what I know and right. understand about this film. I, to make it interesting for myself, I like to still do some research and find a way in. But my way into that was um, via Philip S. Scott. He wanted a piece actually on George C. Scott, which fit for me anyway because i've done so many pieces now for second sight that i'm getting a bit of a i'm getting into i can even in more of a niche of a niche for the, their ghost films which they yeah. do a lot of anyway so you're bound to kind of come across a ghost movie but it seems that i've done uh close encounters of the fourth kind with that one i think it's <laughs> the fourth ghost ghost related one i think i did host late mungo um I can't remember what the other one was. Um, and then obviously the change thing. Yeah, George C. Scott, my God, what what an actor. And that, that's got to help when you're writing a piece and, and the character at the center of it is somebody as formidable as George C. Scott. I mean, he's got yeah. interviews for days. He's got a stature that was intimidating. He's got a, a filmography that is beyond what many actors could even dream of. Mm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, mean, I think... I mean, as that piece picks up on, it's very he, he puts a lot of himself into his performances, and you can tell by not just the performances, but the choices the, right. of the roles he's taken in the first place. They're very much they feel like they're a cathartic exercise for him, and he's kind of just yeah letting it spill out and the rage and and everything that you experience. And I mean, my first introduction to George C. Scott was um, his Christmas Carol, which I think is phenomenal. And, yeah. But I grew up with my dad just hating it, hate, hating his performance. <laughs> you know, he's American. He's got an American accent. What's all that about? I was like, well, you've got to see beyond that. You know, who's to say that, you know, Scrooge in this instance, you know, right. 
he was somebody that maybe settled and he came from that background or or he traveled or he was at, you can kind of read into that I think and I don't think that takes anything away from his performance in fact he does quell his accent I, it's not as bad as my dad ever made it out to be <laughs> I think I think it's one of the best um definitely one of the best Ebenezer Scrooge performances and it's I would probably say Albert Finney's Scrooge is my favorite um but I think that's from more from a nostalgic point of view if I'm being right. objective about it I think A Christmas Carol is a better film and, and then Britain got back at us with Michael Caine uh, taking on the Muppets obviously of course yeah yeah <laughs> that's my favorite it's another it's another good one yeah, I, I've, I've always loved the Muppets. I've, I've got a Muppet tattooed on me. That's how much I love the Muppets. Oh, and Muppets, yeah, Jim Henson, yeah, absolutely, absolutely way in, a, a, a way in for me with film. Right. I would say Jim, Jim Henson. Well, I mean, other than Second Sight, you've you've touched Arrow Video. You're, you're uh, consistently writing for Fangoria and uh, Diabolique and a, a bunch of stuff that you've contributed to over the years. What was uh what, what was what got you started in, into contributing? Um, so I, I worked as a graphic designer and illustrator, um, which is something that now has kind of dropped off because of the journalism. So my, I'm an educator, really. I'm, I, I'm in higher education and, um, course lead, um, at degree level. So that's really where my, um, that's where everything works for me and comes in because everything I practice outside of my teaching for me is to inform how I am as an educator and vice versa as well, to be honest. Um, so I would probably say about 20 years ago, maybe early noughties, uh, I was working as a graphic designer and it was just as, you know, the internet was really, it was booming then and I was working for an e-commerce company and I was discovering really what the internet was about and and how much as as everybody was how much you could find out and reviews right. and websites and how much it, it more easily accessible it was to be able to get your work out there and contact magazines as well so there was um i spoke about this on um chasing labels and yep. there was a magazine called hot dog which was fantastic really good magazine so i dabbled in it then but what happened was I was so sucked into um, my graphic design and then changing course um, career direction slightly as well by going into education and still being freelancer. And then I wrote a novel as well at the same time. And so much was happening. I got married and I had a kid. So my f- my film... My love of film was just that. I kept it purely as something I just absorbed and I, and I was quite happy just to watch stuff. And then about three or four years ago, I worked on a project, which I can't really say anything about at the minute because it got shelved through due to some Harvey Weinstein level <laughs> controversy. Some people will probably work out what, what film it is. Um, it's shelved. It will see a release. But it that commission came from me deciding to write a book about that particular film um and then via the links to that book that then gave me the contacts to start contributing to fangoria which is probably what i'm i guess the fangoria pieces are the most have been the most consistent Um, things like the boutique labels even though I am on a fair few releases there is no way I'm in the levels of like Lee Gambin and Kat Ellinger (laughs) and all of the no way Um, I'm just scratching the surface Um, but you know it's their full time um, Kat in particular so that's her full time job with me it's like I've got other things that I really do need to to focus on so for me it's kind of something that I'm taking a hell of a lot more seriously now and it's nice to kind of have the work out there. So that was the route in. I dabbled in it before, and then I kind of came back to it. And I'm always using it in my lectures. And, I'll, I'll, you know, I do cinema courses as well um, in the evenings. Um, right. So I've got my main job. And then I'll finish there, and then I'll go down to my local cinema, local art house cinema, Broadway cinema in Nottingham. And then I'll do, mainly at the minute, it's Hollywood courses, because they're the ones that I've seemed to have found a, a little bit of a corner on. And 
no one else is covering that. So I've start, I started with new Hollywood and then I kind of moved into the eighties and then I've gone back to like old Hollywood and, nice. and I'm doing Holly weird soon, which I'm going to be looking at Lynchy and LA kind of vibes. And so, yeah, it, that's kind of the path and where, where it's, where it's gone really. It's really exciting. And it's, it's, it's a long um, way to say you're good at everything. I, I'm going to throw that out there. First of all, is you are kind of great at everything you touch. Well, thank you. I don't, I, I don't think I am. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things I'm, I'm not good at, like mowing the lawn, the grass needs put in. <laughs> well, at least that's, that's personal. You can keep that quiet. But, I mean, even with the graphic design, uh, maybe an odd compliment, but I kind of want to throw out there, just so people really want to go take a look at it, your website is probably mm. the best website for any of these contributors. I got to say it works right. It looks good. It is logical uh, on where you would navigate. It is, it is easily the best. Oh, that's, that's really, that's really kind. Thank you. I, I appreciate it so, so much. It's the only place now that I utilize my graphic design skills. I miss it. I miss it a lot, but I've had to only in, practicing and it's the, the odd little thing if somebody asks me I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be able to turn stuff away somebody asked me oh could you just do me a logo um then yeah I'll, I'll i'll do a logo for them or i'll do a little bit of design work i mean i love typography um yeah. and i do love illustration i still draw with my daughter still got that skill set i can sketch stuff out and i can i can do all of that but i don't show it off online i don't do, I, I had a deviant art page for my sins it's a terrible website now where that's going um so yeah i had a, a design website and that's all my freelance but it's just my skills have shifted towards another one of my passions and to be honest probably the thing i am and have always been most passionate about it's always film yeah and and that's you know it's come full circle now and because i'm being drawn more into the media department as well at, at the college you know i'm getting to use the tv studio and the podcast lounge and and, and just introduce some of the students more probably more so as we start a new academic year that will probably kick, kick up a bit and and do our own festivals at the college and use everything that i do i want to learn something from and share and Another great thing as well at some festivals, if I can hook up with people that happen to be, I don't know, but like Amber, for instance, if you've come across Amber T, she's, I think me and Amber, I think we're the only British contributors to Fangoria. So it's been quite nice to hook up hmm. with her at the festivals. And if there's somebody needs an interview and it's like, well, you know, you've not done that yet. So you go and do it and have a bit of a practice. Right. I think that comes from me being at college and I just love to sort of have those connections and give people it's not always about like taking control of it yourself. And, you know, if I can take some students to, you know, if they have the opportunity, some of the film students, if we have those links and we can do that, there's a lot of it is about forging those links, I think, and not just for myself, but hopefully from others that, that may be able, may be able to benefit from that. Right. The young, the youngsters, the youth. <laughs> we we were talking before we started recording about one of the aspects so i, I got to kind of link it to this and that's really how important this community has been i mean there, there's so many people that i hate to use the word networking because it's it's not really just about that but just meeting people and kind of validating the feelings that people like you and i have had where mm. for years film is that passion but i don't know if, if you're like me but in like my everyday life Nobody else gives a shit about any of this. Nobody. No. I've grown <laughs> up like that. I mean, I'm an only child. So right. my mum and dad are, they're not, they're very, they're both very pragmatic people and they're not, they're not create. I mean, my mum, I think she was probably somebody who could have been an illustrator herself, but she just didn't really have that kind of guidance and um, the right people to say, right, you, you go here and you do this, this and this. Um, but in terms of film, a film is just something they watch and it's like, I watched this film last night. Yeah, it's good or it's bad. That's it. End of yep. argument. Whereas I've grown up um, just being a, it's, it was a reverse effect by them not being like that. I was craving it by them not taking me to the cinema regularly. I was craving it. So it just developed the imagination because 
lots of people talk about this um, and we're probably the last generation that would have gone to the cinema and it was three years until you saw that film again unless you went and bought another ticket yep. to go straight back in it's not like now where you can you watch stuff on streaming and flick through thumbnails for 40 minutes before you've even decided to watch something and then watch the same thing over and over again as many times yep. as you want it never leaves you and i think it's kind of a bit of a um we take it for you know a lot of people take that for granted but um back then yeah it was incredible really because you would you that film would percolate for three years or part of the film would percolate because you bricked it watching it and right. you couldn't watch anymore um that was an amazing thing and it affected our brains in a, in a very very different way i think that's fascinating that's that's a in book in itself isn't it the way that Oh, yeah. information or the way that a certain time period or film has affected people is, is, is a fascinating thing. And uh, honestly, it touches on something I've actually been thinking about lately, because obviously there's a lot of studies going on around like ADHD and the way that people are consuming everything nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's this, everything has to move quickly. It's not something that we can sit with and really absorb. I, yeah. I've, I've started to wonder, will there be genuine nostalgia for the film's in this part of our generation because no. yes you can watch it multiple times but you're not mm -hmm. watching it once and then no. dreaming about it for three I years think, i might be wrong but from my point of view i feel that nostalgia is something that that, that rests and, and percolates and you know has kind of we've almost kind of had a little bit of a nostalgia overload and probably our generation in particular is very guilty of, of just cherry picking all those things yes. we've loved and smashing it together to make something like stranger things, which is entertaining and it's a gateway. Like my daughter loved stranger things until then she started watching or was introduced to things like the originals, the carpenter Spielberg and suddenly she's like, she's gone right off it because yep. she do, she now sees it as a bit of a cheat. I mean, I'm not for that. And I don't think that, I think as a, a child brain is seeing it like that, but I like to sit down and go, well, no, let's think about this, right? That at the end of the day, this is a show that is, yes, very, very popular. But the good thing it is doing, as like Quentin Tarantino, is it's bringing in new generations like yourself to be able to watch those things. Now, not everybody is lucky enough to have a dad that is completely overloaded with all this stuff and can show you and <laughs> cherry pick those exact same things. You would probably have to go and discover that yourself, or you'd yeah. be, have to be with the right group of friends in the playground that would then have come across that. But I don't think that is alive anymore because it's like the TikTok the the snippets like you said the adhd shaped media of just firing stuff constantly and also coming up with things that is very very quick bursts of, of, of information more so than ever yeah. now like what we're doing now discussing film is only going to get so many people watching it because they'll zone out I was certainly zone out from me gabbing on for five <laughs> minutes. And, you know, it's like you do a TikTok version of this and it's like you've got 300,000 likes yeah. or what in it. That, that absolutely baffles me. And I am not the sort of person to want to or feel the need just because everyone else is doing that and going on TikTok and needing all of those likes and watches that I would have to do that to go and make someone go and read my material or watch a film I love. I don't right. want to buy into that particularly. I would much rather just, well, I'm writing something first for me because I've loved to do it and I've been commissioned to do it. And if anybody gets to read that, if one person gets to read that George C. Scott essay and they discover George C. Scott, then I've done my work. I've done it. I've done my work. That's good enough. Well, in today's time, also, even if you did fall into that trap, I don't know that those people convert to readers necessarily. Somebody that's that's watching a, no. a 60 second TikTok doesn't mean that they can sit down and read 12 pages about George C. Scott. No. And I think that's that's the thing that really does. It saddens me. I've got to be careful what I say, really, being an educator. And I think but because I'm in there and I'm in the thick of it, 
and I and I've been in it 20 years now. Yeah. I've got 20 years to measure against what I feel is pretty accurate to say that there are so many students in the classroom and if I show them a very quick snippet of something, it will engage them. If I give them a research exercise where they have to go away and read something and then come back and write something on it, 90% of them will shut off and will not engage at that level. So that's what is already differentiating those from that are academic and those that aren't. And let's be realistic, not everybody is academic and who wants to be? You know, not everybody wants to be be academic. Um, and that's fine. You can still learn and you, there's still different ways of learning. But from my point of view, it's like the teacher hat goes on. Inside, I'm screaming. On the right. outside, I'm like, well, let's find a different way of doing that then. Because <laughs> it, it does, it, it, sh- it absolutely shocks me to the core. But I have to like be completely professional about it still because I've right. got to engage that person individually. So my challenge is how do I get them to go away and look at something? And usually the best way of doing it is to sit down and have a conversation with them individually if you're able to do that and if you've got 25 30 students in the room a lot more difficult if it's at higher education where the numbers are usually smaller on our courses anyway you can usually sit down and engage them um i had a really uh, an amazing um sort of level up on a on a learner this year and it was it was pretty inspiring actually they, it, it was um black student from um you know one of the roughest areas of 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 london um you know real kind of proper he had a proper story to tell um and it was he trains to be a footballer he's actually he'll be a professional footballer he's actually in the training um for it um and he was managing that all alongside the course now straight away you know not academic in the slightest really difficult he actually failed the first year it was a case of you know right okay we're having to he's gonna have to reset and we're gonna have to go through this and is he gonna learn from the mistakes and he slowly did he didn't immediately but there was a it was almost like a a moment where it was like the cogs just turned finally in his last year of the second year bearing in mind he'd already repeated he'd been there three years (laughs) and he chose the topic of um i think looking at i think he wanted to look at violence in cinema which is a very common thing to look at and usually i'm a little bit unless they understand and and kind of have a way into that because normally it's like their idea of violence in cinema is so shallow um because they are just seeing the guns and the knives and the horrible things that you see on the screen not really stepping back from a zero where's this coming from so anyway started off gave him bonnie and clyde and there was a real pushback against it because this film is ancient to somebody who is 18 19 (laughs) ancient yeah the film is 10 years old to a 16 year old is an old movie so there was some pushback on it and he watched it he watched the first 20 minutes and you could see him like cringing and really sort of starting to whinge and complain about oh this is boring yeah really kind of shooting it down straight away i left it and i left him to it the next week he came back and he'd watched it twice and it blew his mind he did he pushed past it and for somebody who wasn't academic he struggled with his writing he managed to produce something that you know, wasn't like an A-class piece of writing, but it was really interesting to see where he was coming from and what he understood. And it was through having a conversation with him. Right, we've watched the film. What did you see? What was it about? Why is it a liminal moment in cinema? Why is this movie so important? And just giving him those questions to have a think about. I think that's, that's the way. But again, not even, that doesn't work for everybody. Right. They're all individuals. And coming back to ADHD, um, you know, the, the, we've come out of COVID, but the other thing that is that I've noticed, obviously a lot of people are noticing, is, you know, the increased um, epidemic of mental mental health and, and how COVID has, has fed into that. So before I can even have those conversations and talk to the students, 
all of that is already there that you're right. the barriers and the things that you're having to push through to do with mental health right a week's gone by you've only written two lines of text or you've only done one sketch is that good enough you know in the olden days you'd have just been able to go you you're bone idle really aren't you you're just yeah. lazy you really you can't say that there's no way you could say that you've got to be really kind of softly softly gently gently right okay you've only written one line of text what why is that what and you have to then have this conversation about what and then that opens up well this happened to me and that happened to me and it's it's really difficult really difficult because well, i am not um a therapist or right. a you know support worker but you're expected to be now in in teaching I would be fascinated to hear how your conversations have changed over the last 20 years because oh, vastly from the, literally screwing stuff up. I literally w w used to take things off a student as an exercise, take it off them and say, look, what, what is it with this? I'm exaggerating. I didn't screw it up, but I say, <laughs> right, this is good enough. It's not, is it to, to now it's like, you have to sort of really take it apart and find, you know, ways of how they can improve it. But in the olden, yeah, in the olden days, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even, yes, you could be more kind of upfront and say, I'm sorry, that, you, you're just not going to cut it. You've got to, right. you know, this, you are going out into the real world and you are going to work. So nobody's going to employ you. It's as simple as that. And it's still that now inside my head. That is exactly what you should be said. You should be able to say that you should, because you are not preparing them for that. The softly, softly, right. gently, gently approach will work for so long until it kind of then clicks for them. They, re they realize, ah, right. So I think sometimes the way around that is when you get industry in, and when you get a journalist or a graphic designer or a filmmaker or someone from the BBC come in and basically impart exactly what we've been telling them for a year or two, sometimes they then, yeah, their ears prick up and they go, all right, the, the tutors aren't talking a load of shit then. They know what they're talking about. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's what it's like, yeah. We uh we we talked about this briefly on my show last night uh for just a few moments but I I feel like the that first generation that you were teaching really you know coming up through the 90s was very like doe-eyed and e expecting the this almost uh like perfect life eventually to be yeah. happening and then once uh, you know post 911 uh, a lot of the wars of the early 2000s that were happening Mm -hmm. So much has just been nonstop for these these last couple of generations of students yeah. that you do kind of have to realize a lot of these people have just been facing trauma since the oh, day they were born. this is exactly what it is. Yeah, and I think you have to... It is scarily quite easy to forget that. So at right. the forefront, you're having to think, oh, Jesus, you know, okay, yes, at some point they will have to start taking responsibility to complete their assignment or their work, take responsibility of the course, the things they're learning. They're having these choices given to them, you know, they're learning, et cetera, et cetera. But, yeah, you step back and you go, absolutely, none of this is their fault. They, As with all of us, we're all a product of the society we live in, the environments, yeah. the way we're brought up, all of that before it starts getting into psych psychology session. But yes, post 9-11, absolutely. I also think um, UK-wise, I think we notice this a lot. I only taught in schools very, very briefly when I, after I'd done my teacher training. Um, secondary schools, in particular, awful, just and horrible. And yeah. I just didn't like it as an environment. And you really do see, and I think you notice as well when you have children, that because it's built on a factory system, it's just a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. And it's never, yep. ever, ever altered since in the UK. The curriculum is rigid. We are going to teach this, this, and this. Um, if they go to a Catholic school, even more rigid, the Catholic schools then just become a pedestal to preach, you know, religious values to. And sometimes 
the education is a bar is a, is just a side a line that, yeah which you know is isn't good um but you know there are some good schools there are some amazing schools um but i do think the actual education system what that creates is when they get to the levels i teach at from 16 so level three to then through to he where it starts to become about a little bit more ownership because at the end of the day they're paying for the course by then so you get the best students anyway but level three they don't know how to think for themselves they don't know how to like you know they haven't got the cut the confidence is completely smashed um because they've got teachers going terrible you don't don't do i want you to do it like this don't ask too many questions you know it's kind of you know, hand goes up and in already the teacher is measuring how many students they're going to be able to answer a question. And and also the ridicule as well that you would get at, at, at secondary school. Um, I mean, in the 80s, uh, I remember, yeah, being at school, teachers said things to you um, and there was no beating around the bush. They said it and that was it. And you dealt with it. Um they ridiculed you if you, you know i was terrible at maths and things like that i say i was terrible i just couldn't give a shit about <laughs> math or science right. or any of these subjects i just didn't have an interest i was that sort of learner if i wasn't interested in it i would just be like the class clown and just be like larking about so yeah there was some management there with the teachers but some of them would literally you know they would really ridicule you you, you will never get anywhere without mathematics you need this um you know constantly telling you that and you look your brain i mean my brain didn't work like that i probably thought one of the fortunate ones that just saw through that kind of um i don't know almost like that you saw through the pedestal that they were putting themselves on you think they're just yep. it's just something they're saying and and to be honest i was confident enough in my abilities in other things that i loved and that i really focused on that then the teachers were like, yes, you know, there's a talent here, go for that. Um, some kids don't have that. They don't know what right. they want to do. They don't They don't really have or, – or, and this is another thing it comes back to, is if you have a conversation with some learners, it's actually quite difficult, even just at a level, a personable level, to get anything out of them of what they're interested in. If you come down to their level and just – Put the lesson out the window, what they're learning. What are you into then? What have you been doing over summer? And you just get a shrug of the shoulders up. You just get that. It's like, well, what what do you do at home in your own time? And it's literally just a shrug of the shoulders. It's so hard to get them to share what they're into because some of them might not, A, have any interest right. or they're not confident sharing that with you because they think you're going to ridicule them like they may have done at school because the school is beating out of them that they shouldn't be you're in an art lesson you shouldn't be copying um comic book illustrators artwork that's not art look at picasso and all of this nonsense it's like i went through that i i i saw that as nonsense i learned a lot from studying comic book artists then when i got to art college when i did foundation yes that was almost an epiphany when you finally discovered like the Bauhaus or yeah, Picasso and you understood then what abstract art was, but not all of them do. They, they, they're not, they don't know how to find, find things and find information. And nowadays in the swamp that is the internet and streaming and everything just, and content, hate that term hate that word. content <laughs> ironically we're becoming part of content of course um but yeah it's it, it is it's like you've got to be able to know how to find those golden nuggets i i think which are just like spark something and just then you kind of go off in one direction and you're like oh my god this is absolutely fascinating right i want to i'm so thirsty for this now i need to draw it i need to paint it I need to write about it. Amazing. I remember being at art college. I remember my lecturer coming up to me and I was working on this, this oil painting. It was the first time I was learning how to use oils. Um, and he came up to me and he looked at this painting. Now, this is a prime example of how important it is to, to be educated and know your stuff and go out there and find things and un- at least understand 
what right. has gone before. And at 18, I thought what I was painting was the most original thing out there. <laughs> Didn't we all? Yeah. I see it. I see it <laughs> in my own students. Everything they do, they think it's the most original thing. They've never not been done before. And what it was, it was just, I'd, I'd studied, um, they gave us a topic of, of stairways. They always give you something really mundane to look at in, in order to find something interesting. So I was kind of tracing stairs and then going and exploring old buildings and turning this, getting tracing paper and then retracing over that and then putting the stairs together in an oil painting. Well, it just became an Escher painting. <laughs> I never knew who Escher, paint, Escher was. And the lecturer's like, looks like an Escher painting. And I was like, huh? Who's Escher? He introduced me to Escher and it was like, oh my God. It was, but by osmosis, because one of the earliest films I'd seen, or the earliest people, it had an influence on me getting into movies. Jim Henson, coming back to Jim Henson, you know, Dark Crystal via Labyrinth and yep. David Bowie and the stair. You know, it's again another artist being influenced by Escher. So it was kind of teaching me that every artist is inspired by other artists and that what you put down isn't original never really is it's just a version of what you bring to it um i don't know did it did it stop me painting those stairs no but i've seen it in students right. where you do say something to them and they just completely lose heart so you you have to make them understand that no this is still your work it's your version of that what can you do to make that a little bit different? What other influences can you bring into that just to put another twist on it? The more you absorb, the more it will come out. You don't understand that when you're young. One thing that we don't ever really talk about in terms of this is that the act of being inspired is act, it can be a skill set that, that people yeah. don't understand that you need to have. So whether it's film, writing, or artist, uh, there's so much that even just seeing something while that can inspire you, th there's ways to pull from that. There's ways for you to grow that in you. And depending on your influences and how you've been raised in your experiences and everything yeah. around you, that can quash that, that can completely embolden that. There, there are multiple ways that we can be inspired. So, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, you bang on. Definitely. There is absolutely a skill set in that. I think only since I've been teaching have I understood that because it, in a way, it's, it's a strange thing when you when you're when you are teaching. Yes, you kind of you know, there's your audience and platform and the people you're imparting knowledge on. Right. But at the same time, it's automatically giving you a perspective of a how much you know and how, how much other people don't know, and that's not in an arrogant way. It's just a right. Okay, so I understand this. And this is the level that we're coming in at them. So right. I have to immediately, it's like dialing things down, completely dialing it down. If I'm writing an essay for the boutique labels or if I'm doing something for Fangoria, my writing, what I'm imparting there, I'm firing on, a, on 110%. It's like using every bit of... every part of what I know and more and even things I'm learning as well through right. that writing but sometimes if I'm teaching it might be that I'm only I'm having to deliver at 50 percent of what I know sometimes even 10 percent that's and that that's not to sound like really negative it's just the way you have to work as a tutor otherwise you will completely lo lose them right. I have to because I'm teaching at different levels so if I'm teaching on the final year of a BA the degree level then obviously my knowledge is, is i'm going to ramp that up because i know they're ready for that and it's all part of the progression as well you've got to show progress the progression of the learning you're not going to go in there firing 100 percent. you'd scare the shit out of them and you'd lose 80 <laughs> percent of your students as well right and the college would be like what the hell's happened to your students where have they gone you can't do that well and not to mention delivering that in that environment is unfiltered unprepared yeah. unedited and when you're writing for fangoria a lot of people don't realize you've written that probably four times and gone over it with the fine tooth comb many yeah. many times maybe had somebody else look at it and it's it is the complete like what you see is is the perfect progression of all of the work that you could pour into this tiny article yeah definitely
Yeah, and that, it's quite nice to read students' essays and sort of, again, that's that's another measurement of, okay, this is what this individual knows, this is what they've learnt, this is what they've understood, um, but backing it up as well. Another thing as well, I mean, just going back to what I was saying earlier, is that even just teaching them about plagiarism, you would be surprised how many of them will do that by default. Now, some of them do it intentionally. They absolutely do it intentionally because they know no other way around getting past this essay because they cannot write. They right. cannot string a sentence together. They really struggle. Um, and that's because, you know, they've had a bad time at school. Again, it's the school system um, telling them they're worthless and this and that. It's not good. Um, but then you'll get some that, they don't realise they've plagiarised. So, for instance, you have, you know, if they're going to do a, a bit of research and they don't put their citations in the right format, then obviously when we put that through the system, um, you know, it scans it and it shows us. I used to use my, you know, have to use my discretion to say, well, they've tried, that is clearly a quote, they've just not formatted right. it properly. Um, there might be that they... Yeah, they literally lift. I mean, I've had literally students. I've had grown men in their late forties on courses hand essays into me, knowing and knowing full well that they did not write that because I've had conversations with them. It's why I have conversations with students as well, so I can gauge their voice and what their their, their language and their vocabulary. You read the essay, and you go, they haven't read that. <laughs> you don't even have to go through the official software. You right. literally cut and paste the first paragraph into Google. It will take you straight to the essay. I had one student, this this particular student, yeah, late forties, mature student, um, and he cut and pasted the whole essay except for, in my opinion, clunk, and it was like the whole essay was cut and pasted. So I, I, I got him in the office and I showed him this essay. I was like, could you just explain why this is, you know, again, soft, you know, even something as serious as that, you know, you have to like, could you just explain to me why, in the right. old days, you're like, after the course, you know, it's fraud, <laughs> basically. Um, and he responded with, um, have you ever heard the expression, great minds think alike? He actually said that to me. <laughs> I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And this is the same student who basically um, printed out a 72 DPI um, sketch of a, a kettle design or something, because he was a 3D student, um, and printed this thing out and blew it up to A4 and then signed the bottom <laughs> of this. And it was a pixelated sketch. He was trying to sell off as like a genuine <laughs> real sketch that he how how was how he fitting in that room with you that, with his massive balls? I mean, yeah, <laughs> that, that is wild. <laughs> oh, he had balls. Yeah, yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Uh, well, getting back to inspiration and, and getting back to Rich, uh, with people that I especially appreciate writing work and the, the way that they are able to convey a message to people, many people would look at this and say, well, what are some of your favorites? I, I'm more curious what inspires you as a writer? What are some works that over your life have been th the pieces that make you say, damn it, I want to write like that? Um, are we talking like specifically um, essays or books, um, specific writers in, in film? Anything that you want. Yeah. I, mean, I think for me, in terms of journalism, um, I would, I would, it comes back to Mark Commode for me. Mm. And I'm not saying in terms of just his writing. I just think as an individual who just loves films, loves movies, um, and is extremely passionate about it and uh, shares it all the time through his podcasts and everything. Um, so, yeah, Mark Commode, definitely one of them. Um, probably the first person I remember who was remotely... Um, I say journalistic or a, a, a siphon of, of film um, and getting it out there and sharing it. it was in the UK we had um, a program in the late 80s early 90s called Movie Drone with Alex Cox the film director so he would have this show on, on like Sunday evenings BBC 2 and 
it was it was a true awakening. So you had kind of almost, from my point of view, it was like cinema. It was like film before Alex Cox arrived, you know, on Sunday nights and film before. For me, it was like you know everything up to that point was just like the Dark Crystal on loop and Jaws and <laughs> you know the most popular movies you could, you could think of. He comes along. You late. You late. You know. You're late up. You shouldn't. You should be in bed for school on a Monday morning, and you're kind of there lying in bed and watching this guy talk about the most obscure movies. Um, because the great thing about Alex Cox is, you know, he's done. He's a proper the epitome of cult movies, and that's what the program was about. And then Mark Cousins took over them, um, who's gone on to do like story of film, and but yeah, that definitely in terms of like presenting those films. That was a real kind of moment. And that was just around the time, I think, in fact, it wasn't that long after, probably about two years later when I went to art college. Like with everybody, if you do end up at art college, you're just surrounded by fellow weirdos who will just go, here, have you seen this? And they'll like slip (laughs) you a a pirate copy of Man Bites Dog or Clerk. And again, that was another step up for me. It was like, fucking hell what is this i've never seen anything like it like man bites dog at that point in my life when you're 18 and really quite impressionable and oh yeah and you know it it blew my mind absolutely blew my mind but i would probably say at the uh, the last sort of 10 years um i would say um what's his name in fact i've got his book there what's his name i always forget his name yeah, W. Scott Paul that did Wasteland. Have you read Wasteland? I've not read it yet. I've it's been meaning really to. really good. And he did another one called, I think he's the same one that did Monsters in America. Yeah, he is. I've got Monsters in America up there. He does these amazing studies, like deep dives of periods in history in relation to film. So Wasteland is all, all about um, the impacts of World War I and coming back to what you're saying about trauma and how yeah. cinema completely changed with German expressionism and great books, great books. Um, so yeah, there's quite quite a few there. Some that are more kind of written, crossing over into having their own shows. Mark Commode had his own shows, he, and he's always the face right. of film, really, in this country. Um, and then yeah, you've got um, Alex Cox, who I think is is a really good one that crosses over from making those movies, those cult movies himself, and then imparting and sharing the most obscure shit you would have ever have seen, uh, <laughs> at a, you know, the ripe age of, of 13, 14. Right. Well, uh, you know, I, I would be remiss to not dive into some sort of physical media as you have so much behind you. Uh, what are some of the most like exciting things that you've been seeing in your mind lately? Because uh, we, we were kind of touching on Second Sight, and to me, mm. I, I don't know that anybody else is matching them in terms of quality across the board anywhere. No, I'm mean, biased, probably because I've, I've, <laughs> I've wrote a lot. I mean, I've wrote, done a lot for 101. I'm, I've, I've had four back to back recently, um, so you're probably going to see a few, quite a few releases. Whether they are, I don't know if they'll get released back to back. They might spread them out. Are, are but, you on? Fo- I think you're on following coming out, right? Uh, I'm not on following Sarah. Oh, okay. Have you interviewed Sarah Appleton yet? Not yet. I need to. Oh, I'll get her on. She's amazing. Uh, her and Philip. Um, brilliant. Um, she's got a documentary coming out, premiering at Fright Fest, actually, called J Horror Virus. Oh, that's um, right. She did the found footage phenomenon with, with Philip as well. So yep. Philip is now, actually, he kind of heads Second Sight and dishes out the projects. He's a project manager, really. Yeah. Um, so, yeah she's I, th- I think she covered the interview she does a lot of the video footage um extra feature work as well um so no i can't all i can say is i'm doing two abel ferraras i'm doing a denny villeneuve who's what my favorite movie make favorite director at the minute i absolutely adore villeneuve Nice. Um, and I'm doing a Stephen King related release. I say related, tenuous. Very nice. I, man, I, Denis, I, I don't talk about enough on, on the show cause he's genuinely, I, I think he's shown in a very short amount of time, this 
massive amount of growth when you get uh, this, you know, his source material combined with budget and he creates still this just intense drama and beautiful spectacles. He, he is one of them rare filmmakers, isn't it? I guess a little bit like Christopher Nolan coming from following who is, you know, created something. I mean, he made something that was so kind of, you know, ad hoc and improvised right. and but tradition you know real and that's stuck with him i think and that whole play with time and, and everything villeneuve again he's one of those rare filmmakers who crosses over from somebody who's got such a, an artistic vision yeah. like a proper auteur who is now started to become a little bit more commercial oh, some yeah. would say because of the the size of the films but even so they're not they they they're not commercial movies because right. not everybody look they're still obscure enough dune is still an obscure enough story and dense enough to alienate the masses and that, but what he's doing he's breaking down those barriers between the art house and commercial so it's almost like that's what Villeneuve is for me he feels like he's the perfect crossover of somebody who understands the art of cinema and yeah. somebody that uh, understands the spectacle of it who is still able to channel those very 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 quiet uh, moments like a Kurosawa movie the wind right. blowing and he's able to capture that and I don't think many filmmakers now in that stratosphere, on the big screen, in IMAX, are doing that. Two. That's true. Christopher Nolan and him. That's the only, the only two I can think of off the top of my head of, of that generation. I think he is, I mean, he is, and I'm sure everybody else has referred to this, he's, he is the next Ridley Scott, without a shadow of a doubt. Obviously, this connection with Blade Runner, but he's then some. I mean, he's... There is there is something that percolates under Villeneuve's work in terms of what he understands about fear yeah. and how he how he dramatizes that through the canvas of a father whose daughter goes missing to a mother who loses their daughter to fear is the mind killer. You know, it's like, it, it's it's amazing how he just, this is the thing I'm focused on in my movies. This is it. And then he just like builds the canvas up around that. It, in in phenomenal. every genre too. That's the other yeah, thing. Every he, genre. Prisoners, he I think. Over everything. Oh, pri- I mean, Prisoners alone, I think is, do you know what? I'd be hard pressed to find anything better better than that in terms of a thriller. That to me, it's certainly the best, one of the best thrillers this yep. century. Oh yeah, it's certainly within my top three thrillers of all time. Thrillers are so rare; they're like a dying, like a dead genre. That because they kind of get absorbed, the thriller automatically gets absorbed. I feel into other other genres. Yep. Only in the nineties, well, go further back. Thrillers were more distinctive, but the nineties felt like it was like the last decade of the thriller, like. It was a decade which had so many brilliant thrillers, and you could yeah. say they were a thriller. Like now, you can you look at some horror movies and you go, "It's not really a horror movie; it's a thriller." I interviewed um, Dee Wallace the other day, and you know she clearly said, "Not sitting, I don't look at Cujo as a as a horror movie," and she was right. You know, it's not really a horror movie; it is a thriller. Right. It's also domestic drama. It's got these like king elements to it, I think. Yeah, so and some horrifying moments but... and horrifying moments, yeah. But yeah, prisoners. Oh my god! I, I tell you, I could again. I, I could talk three hours on Villeneuve. He he astonishes me. Absolutely, I, I feel like I could talk three hours just on prisoners. The yeah. the, the big thing for me is the the, the performances that he pulls out of. <sighs> specifically like five people in that movie they, they shouldn't be possible to be acting like that. i mean hugh jackman <laughs> yeah he's an amazing actor anyway in that 
I mean, you see him in something like The Fountain when he like breaks down and he's putting the ink into his finger yep. at the ring. Is oh my god, that that mo that is one of the most incredible moments of seeing a man fall apart I've ever seen. Then you see him in Prisoners, and it's the again, it's like come back to George C. Scott, isn't it? Yep. Rage, the rage. Like you don't even, you would never think Hugh Jackman's got that in him because he's such right. a happy, smiley guy and the sing, singing and dancing guy, you know. But he is incredible in Prisoners. Could be his best best performance. I don't think anything comes close to me. I mean, it's but. it's it's pretty phenomenal. I and mean, everybody in that film, Paul Dano, yeah. is just amazing in it. Gyllenhaal can do no wrong for me. Um, yeah, amazing. Gyllenhaal was on a tear around then because I think he was incredible in Nightcrawler too. And that yeah. was yeah. Now Nightcrawler is for me that's um, in my top three movies this this century, absolutely. And if we were talking, yeah, that's kind of another thriller as well. I always think that there's always two movies that really stand out to me this century. And pr obviously, Prisoners is one of them, but I kind of put that in the Villeneuve box. Yeah. Um, looking at movies in general, I always come back to Nightcrawler and The Red Turtle. And it's always what? about them two movies this century for me because it's become... I'm, I'm great at 20th century cinema. The older I've got and the more I've gone into the 21st century where... Let's be honest, we're living in the future we imagined anyway. So things are almost like a lot harder to pinpoint when that film was made. Yep. Everything's a bit more foggy there where I could go, oh, right, well, such and such a film was made in when? 2004. I would really struggle. Um, whereas I can just go, I can rattle off a year from 80s, 90s. I can pinpoint movies in the 20th, 20th century. Um, but for me, Nightcrawler... Um, which again, you know, is like the taxi driver of this century, isn't it? It's yeah. the, the Lou, Lou, Lou Boom uh, vampiric kind of character that's that's out there doing what he shouldn't be doing. And that kind of rise as well. What a character arc. It's amazing. And then the Red Turtle, because I love my animation, I always put that on such a pedestal as well. And I use them films. Those two movies for me are like, a benchmark it's like every film i watch not in a dismissive way i can you know compartmentalize it and the, and the genres and everything but in terms of quality and how something is made they're the benchmarks that for me and wow. when i watch another movie i go oh my god and they seem to come around every decade don't they every decade you'll go and see a movie at the cinema and it might not be a masterpiece. Top Gun Maverick isn't what people would call a masterpiece, but fuck me. <laughs> I like seeing that in the cinema was literally crap. Yeah. Te it's been 10 years, 10 years since I felt like that. It's a feeling. That's what cinema, that's what film does as yeah. well. The feeling where you have to put aside all this snobbishness about, um, I don't watch the MCU because um, I'd much rather go and uh, watch my severing back catalogue of uh, slashes and, <laughs> yep. do you know what I mean? It's yeah. utter nonsense. You can watch the MCU and you can watch Severin cat the Severin exactly. catalogue. And enjoy them both. And enjoy them. Yeah, I, I'm not into this kind of, although I am, I am one of those people that, has become fatigued now i am i have become i hate saying that but i have become superhero fatigued um but i can you know i don't have a problem watching the old the ones i enjoy still i could put winter soldier on one minute and then i watched what was the last thing i watched infinity pool i mean if you want polarizing films <laughs> then just watch anything and everything and test yourself yeah. i mean I, I am known people that know me personally. I have been known for being quite prudish. I have been. But I will watch certain films which will really test my prudishness. Infinity Pool, Pool in particular, <laughs> we know that. You know, but I, you know, I'll watch things like Irreversible and all, all of these yeah. films. Now, I don't choose to watch them 
necessarily because I want to watch that film. It might be because it's a particular filmmaker that I've had to research or I've become interested in their way of filming. And I think what most importantly you get out of really pushing your limits of what you can watch is can you see through the mud and the dirt and the grime right? and, and see the filmmaking? Gaspar Noé is, is a prime example of that, is that his films are so challenging and so explicit. Oh, yeah. But, but you see how well made they are. And there is no way you can say that his movies are bad quality because they are pretty phenomenal in terms of how they're shot and what he plays around with. Really, really incredible. And again, seeing the journey of that filmmaker go from like right. a short film to, you know, an early movie, then post irreversible where his films go and, and what, what he's then doing with camera work, what he's learned from that film, what he's taken into the next one, which I think is, again, coming back, back to Villeneuve, you can see with each movie, and he's on record as saying this, is that he go, he's going through that movie in the same way I like when I go through my essays in learning something and then building on that like bricks with the yep. next film, which is you can clearly see that that journey with Villeneuve, the way his films have just become bigger and bolder, but had the same threads and themes in there, I think. Oh, absolutely. And th that's the best part about looking back, especially when you get some of these boutique releases, because you can you can take that journey in retrospect. So with mm. Villeneuve, you can go back and watch Enemy and see yeah. Gyllenhaal in a performance that who is now put in multiple performances for Villeneuve and see how nuanced he is in this quite honestly it's a fairly simple doppelganger story but yeah. it's overall it's still this like almost a thriller but it's so well done and so engaging oh, not just because of the performances but it's it's capturing something on screen that is and so many people just would have given up on doing something so complex with it oh definitely and that that's a really and that is a very obscure one of his i think it's a yes. very like, kafka-esque kind of thing going on a metamorphosis and yeah looking at the kind of um the way he has that thing with in some of his films he'll very much explore the masculine and then he'll explore the feminine yep and he's very good at that he'll he'll, he'll bring characters to the to the forefront which i think that's why i certainly haven't got any issues at all when he when he starts bringing forward the female characters from the dune a novel in part two because if any director is going to do that and understand the marginalized female characters from the novel and bring them right. more to the front he is going to nail it and and i know that dune part two is going to be incredible i just know it is that that trailer that last trailer I, I mean, I can't even remember the last time I got goosebumps watching a trailer, but that that was phenomenal. But yeah, it comes back, doesn't it, to like, it, you know, again, taste. Dune isn't for everybody. Um, there's many people you'll sit down with, I oh, saw Dune, didn't get it. I didn't right. understand any of it. But did you enjoy it? Some people go, yeah, I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Some will just go, no, it was it was terrible. You know, so that's why I really hate that whole you know, snap decision thing, you get a lot, yep. which is what social media is generated, where, you know, the trolls or the people on a social media post will just go, it was shit. And that was, that's it. It was trash. It was, I mean, come on, come on. Like I can <laughs> understand somebody watching Dune and being completely lost and not understanding it. Right. Um, there's no way you can call that movie trash. <laughs> well, most movie. people that felt that way, they didn't know going into it that it was mostly a, a politics story. Yeah. So it's exactly. it, it's hard to it's hard to to respect that sort of response either. No, nah, you can't. <laughs> but you know, this is coming from maybe people that at least the last ten years they've been used to that kind of storytelling through Game of Thrones, which right. basically Game of Thrones is just. Dune. It's just a yeah. fantasy version of that. Or oh, it's like it's Berserk meets Dune. It's again that takes 
so much from other mediums and genres. I think George R. R. Martin has just kind of just gone, oh, yeah, I really like that manga. <laughs> and I like this sci-fi novel. And he's kind of just done his own thing with it. There's going back to inspiration again, exactly. It is. Just yeah, it is. Absolutely. Something with it. But uh, is well, Game of Thrones bad because of that? No, of course it isn't. It's his own thing. Speaking of inspiration, uh, I, I got to ask, because I, I've enjoyed your writing for quite some time. Um, obviously, you don't have the opportunity to, to write on whichever film you always choose, because not, nothing is always getting out, uh, you know, being released for rich, necessarily. Mm. No. What are what are a handful of films that you would be like over the moon to get offered for? Any any movie, even outside of cult cinema, are we talking of kind of niche? Anything. That, 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 right. Okay. So I mean, I think the one that I've mentioned before that has always been a dream, going back to Nightcrawler, without a doubt. Um, I would, yeah, if I ever ever saw a super duper release. I would absolutely love to write about that. Um, the others that are like the, the, the bigger releases never really, we, we know, we know being in this niche corner that right. those huge releases don't get that sort of treatment anymore. And they certainly don't get essays. So it's always going to come back to very particular films. Um, so yeah, N- Nightcrawler, is right up there um i mean of course holy trinity jaws blade runner the thing they are like the three films i absolutely have always obsessed over and would yeah you know always sort of go back to those three so but (sighs) saying that what else can be written about those films in in all honesty it's got to be a film that and that's why it comes back to something like Nightcrawler. There is so much to write about. And I think even more so now. That's the beauty of that film is that it, we feel like the Lou Blooms are just, they're just there more so now than ever. Oh, and yeah. you can kind of, you know, there's so much to tap into, so many angles um, with that idea of, of, of the media and um yeah how or an individual's kind of um you know the sociopath angle oh my god the um the analogies in there the kind of metaphor the vampire kind of angle yeah wow i i couldn't really put anything above that film what i would what i would love to write about so well, it that film that deserves a deluxe release too. I, I really hope somebody does something for it. Yeah, it needs it absolutely, and it, it is. It's. I do find that when you are writing about films, and I, and I guess that comes from because you pitch as well, and you, you always have to find a sort of fresh angle, which in some ways is. It goes back to what I was on about earlier. You, you need to almost find something that nobody else has written about. Do you know what? Sometimes you just want to write about a film you love, whether someone's written about it or not. Like I have yeah. written about Jaws. I've written about it for, for publications and I've written about Blade Runner for publications and I've written about the thing for publications, but <laughs> I wrote about them f- more so from a, a personal point of view. What is that film to me? What was my memory of it? And what were some of the the understandings of it as well, maybe at an early age or and I think I think you, you get you surprised sometimes how how much people love to hear people's personal points of view about a film. That it's not always about taking it apart in minute detail and always analysing something, which I love to do. But it's exhausting. Like sometimes yeah. you want to kind of just come away from that and go, oh, Jesus. And that's why you need your Winter Soldier films and your MC. And, and you know, I, I often will put some an animate. That's why I love animation. Because animation for me, me is too. a real comfort blanket. If I've absorbed too much shit that's like, oh, God, this is really, this is dark. This, I, you know, I want to wipe infinity pool out of my head then i'll watch super <laughs> <or something. laughs> animation is a great palate cleanser i will oh, say that God, it has you have to do that yeah it's great 
So when you're feeling down after watching too many movies, just go watch like Watership Down or something. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's another one. I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to write something about Watership Down. Which um, there was going to be a BFI release of that. But yeah, they pulled it, which was gutted about that. Well, and uh, they did that recently for Targets, and then that came back. So I'm, yeah, it did. I'm curious. Maybe Criterion is doing a, a release, and they're waiting to release a BFI till after yeah, that or something. Possibly. I think with Could Target, be. it was. I think it was something to do with the timing of it, wasn't it? Because of the subject matter. Yep. I think that's why it was pulled originally. I don't think it was something to do with rights or other releases. I might be wrong. Yeah. They, unfortunately, we don't always get the answers to these either. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, Nightcrawler, the Red Turtle, great, great options here. Um, I, I do want to point everybody to Rich's website again. A anything that you want to learn, you've got everything laid out so wonderfully there, just accessible. You've got links to everything. Um, writing for Fangoria, you've got Second Sight, 101 Films. Anything else coming up that you want to hype up for anybody? So at the minute, um, in fact, the last few months, I've been focusing more on sort of interviews Mm -hmm. written interviews i mean i'm obviously i am interviewing them um backstage um and then i'm kind of putting stuff out via um arrow arrow films website and fangoria as well so for arrow it's it i i did a series of interviews that were linked to um arrow players curation service called selects Mm -hmm. So if you go on Arrow Player, you'll notice that um, you know Josh Rubin, who's who's been on this show, um, who's he's great. I mean, he's just so generous with his with his time. Um, so I've done, I did an Arrow one with Josh. Um, who else have I done? Anthony Scott Burns that did Come True. That's a great movie as well. Oh yeah, in recent years. Um, uh, upcoming, um, I think it was just announced. Got Reese Shearsmith again, who I've interviewed before. So sometimes I, I've, I've kind of interviewed people two or three times. I, I go back to them and go, "Oh, do you want to do this?" So what's yeah. and what's happened from that with with certain contacts or people I've met at festivals? Um, I've then um, presented a, an idea for something, hopefully, which will go out by the time this is. Um, this goes live um, is I'm getting get I'm inviting guests in to explore Fangoria's uh, magazine archives. So what they do is oh. they'll pick three, three Fangoria issues from, from the back issues from like the eighties and nineties. Um, and then they discuss those issues um, and specifically the films that are on those covers. And it's been a really nice thing to do. So the first one, um, who's the first one that's coming on is Gala Avery from Video Archives podcast. Wow, who was an utter delight. She's she's yeah, really really easy to chat to. Um, very knowledgeable, as you know, you see on um, listen to on on the video archives. She's one that goes toe to toe with with her dad and Quentin Tarantino <laughs> on, on that. So she's she's brilliant to chat to and then um i've got pat and oswalt as well after that wow so that's what i've been focusing on is is using my kind of some of my networking and the contacts i've got so far to propose and, and try and get people to do interviews with a bit of a, a bit of an angle a bit of a bit of a twist that um, so i can focus on that and then what i'm trying to do is match up um because I tend to focus on anniversary pieces. Yeah. If there's ever an opportunity to merge those, where it'll be an anniversary piece, but it'll be an interview, like the T Psycho 2 with, with Tom Holland, and I've got um, Cujo 40th with D Wallace as well. I, I tend to try and do that as well. It doesn't always right. work, because, you know, what's the chances of getting William Friedkin right. to the Exorcist <laughs> 50th? You know, it's, I'm going to have to find another way around, around that. So... <laughs> So that, that, that will be the latest ones to look out for. And then whenever, I guess, some of the 101 news drops, um, Crimes of the Future, imminent, but I think it's been pushed forward. I think yeah. it's the 11th of September, if I recall. Yep. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Um, Fright Fest will be the next big thing. So if there's anybody, yeah, anybody in the UK 
come and say hello. I'll be there for five, the five days. Um, I'll be in some of the press screenings that I'm going to be trying to put out. I don't normally write reviews, um, but I'm taking a, m- more than advantage of it at Fright Fest because they're, they're screeners and I love to support independent cinema. Right. And if I get that opportunity, I've seen some absolute corkers so far. Um, literally fresh off the colour grade. <laughs> and like the are over and it's yeah re- really interesting to um watch so i think eight eyes um i've got next to watch which is creating a little bit of buzz um yeah and as i said sarah's um documentary j horror uh, nice. virus i i can't wait to see that one that's i've something about Asian cinema has just all encompassed me over these last few years. I, I've mm-hmm. a lot of these boutiques giving it so much love, obviously on the martial arts side, but the, the horror and the drama side has finally gotten some good yeah. love and nice attention. I mean, you, Eureka, who I've done a few pieces for have really focused yeah. on that the last couple of years. It's been nice to see that, you know, obviously they've gained a lot of rights to a lot of Asian cinema yeah. um, and there's some brilliant ones um, coming out. Uh, um, you know releases as well recently um is it uh revenge i can't remember what it's called now it's a samurai movie by the same writer as seven samurai i i feel like that's right it's either that or something's revenge yeah i can see the picture of it now that was um that's one that's on my list to get because I, I really want to see that it's meant to be amazing so yeah, Eureka, yeah. Eureka, fantastic, really good label. They're, they're special too, because again, mm-hmm. uh, the the spreading out of genres, and a lot of people have complained because uh, Eureka has done so many martial arts films over the last couple of years. But it's mm. it's not just martial arts. A lot of their stuff, it's martial arts with a comedy angle, or it's martial arts that are fully dramatic, or yeah. uh, it's it's rarely just like an action fest. Yeah. Oh no, it is definitely a yeah. There's a, there's a mix in there, and but you know they still put out their silent classics and right. you know the odd. It's like the odd noir in there. I think it's mainly come out of the rights coming to an end on certain films, so they've had to focus on getting as much of the the yep. Asian material out, which they they got hold of, and then they'll there might be a period where then it will kind of revert back, and there'll there'll be a flux of silent cinema again yeah. um but yeah i think they're an amazing label and you know, there's a lot of fantastic labels out there i was really sad to see network on air go into liquidation yes. because they put out some some incredible films and and do you know what there were some movies that i remember clearly discovering through network on air um such as um uh what's it called it's called raw meat in uh america Deathline in the uk they put an incredible blu-ray out of that and it was the first time probably about five years ago first time i'd ever seen this film wow. I en- and i ended up doing a, a 50th piece for fangoria on it and it it's just a brilliant movie and i'll recommend to anybody who's never seen it it's one of the best horror movies of the 70s and it's kind of Pre Texas Chainsaw Massacre as well, and it's got that that gnarly um, vibe to it as well. The special effects are, you know, fresh. They don't feel stale and dusty like right. a Hammer movie. It's really a, a kind of a. It feels like a real bridge between those films and then what started to come with Texas Chainsaw. Nice. Um, and it was lovely as well. I got a, a random message, like a DM message via um, Twitter, I think. And it was it was from the, from the director. Like he'd, re- <laughs> he'd read this piece, and I was like, "It's a joke." And it was actually him. <laughs> nice. Um, That's yeah, gonna be validating. Amazing, amazing film. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's it's one of it's quite very much overlooked. I think. Have you, did you manage to pick that up? I did not. I think I only have like three network releases. It's, have you it's got a, that line, Rob, no. at all on any other foot? Right. Absolutely put that right at the top of your list. If you can hunt it down. Consider it purchased. If, if you can get the network version, because it's great. And it's the, the restoration of it. 
it just looks incredible and it's great because it's got um, Donald Pleasant in it and he's it's always good yeah he's a little bit hammy in it but it kind of it sort of fits fits with the <laughs> film and there's a, there's a bit that's pre American Wealth in London I don't want to spoil it for people but you watch it and you go surely to God John Landis watched this film and there's a specific moment you just go oh my God it's exactly nice. like it <laughs> uh we, we've been sort of speculating about the network thing a little bit and obviously you're not going to have you know major answers or anything like that but mm. any any insider ideas that you know could do you think anybody would pick up a, a lot of the rights that network had because a, a lot of the films they released no one else has released them anywhere else well they had a niche in the british television yeah angle um you know, they can't, they, they released, um, you know, Captain Scarlet and uh, Robin of Sherwood, which is yeah. arguably the greatest Robin Hood adaptation. Um, so I think it's, I haven't heard anything personally, but I think it's, it's whichever label sees that they probably want to have that catalogue because that's what Network really owned, I think. Right. Um, I think personally they are a really good fit to have as something to be absorbed into second sight um, because you are getting some labels now. Radiance are very big on bringing over, yeah. um, you know, like Fun City editions. That 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 they become Radiance are, are not just becoming this selfish brand. They're becoming like this umbrella. Um, to bring in other labels that they can distribute and get out there, which Jesus, I, I can't keep up with radiance. I cannot get over what Fran is doing over there. It's unbelievable it's what he's putting out, like one thing after the other. So if, if a label such as second side do, do a similar thing, because at the end of the day, there's still that catalog there. The, if nobody buys it up, it's just going to fall by the wayside and just become EBA scalpers, eBay scalpers. Yep. You know, just kind of having this stuff, and then just because it's no, it's deleted or a label's gone into liquidation, the prices are going to go through the roof. And I think it's yeah, it would be a shame if that happens. So I think, yep. Yeah, somebody definitely needs to do something with it because that it's just incredible stuff they've got. Really it is. good. Um, well, I, I, I'd love to give you back your evening. Thank you for, for all of this time so far. Um, th this welcome. has been astonishing the journey through, through teaching and inspiration and, uh, a, a lot of just the obscure parts of this conversation. I don't, I don't see having that conversation with many other people. So thank you. You, you're welcome. That's been, a, it's been great. It's good to chat. Who doesn't like to chat about movies? <laughs> right no. and I, I don't get a chance to talk about nightcrawler very often uh to I even know. move i mean it's like it's said, amazing it, it's an episode in itself I, and i <laughs> i am noticing the more the more people i'm in i'm in interviewing in the industry as well is they're more than happy just to talk about films they love films that's why they are in the industry you know not just because they want to make them but they love movies right. and they love to talk about them and that they're fans first and foremost. And it's it's lovely to see that. Um, I mean, some of these interviews I've done, I kind of wish I did have my own YouTube or my yeah. own podcast, but I just there's not enough time in the day for me. I have to just find a particular focus. Because some of them you listen to and you just go, oh my God, this is gold dust. This is a podcast yep. episode. It's so funny. Like Pat and Oswald, as you can imagine. Yeah. I mean, we we disappeared down a, i had to edit it out of what i was writing because it wasn't relevant but we disappeared down a tom cruise rabbit hole <laughs> and it was just amazing and we were talking about you know separating him you know the, the scientologist from the filmmaker and <laughs> it, the way he was responding to it was oh my god it was just amazing absolutely amazing it'd be a sort of thing if i had a patreon I'd be like, I'd, I'll put it on a Patreon account or something. Yeah. But yeah, amazing, really. That's it's great. Incredible. I, I love Patton. Um, 
anyways, uh, for everybody else that watches and listen, please go check out the links in the description below. Rich is uh, getting to be prolific and in lots of different places. So make sure that you stay up on it because, man, high quality all, all across the board. So thank you for all of that. Oh, thanks, Ryan. And thanks for your support as well. It's lovely to yeah hear feedback and you know people are actually reading the essays. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh well we're, we're gonna have to do this again eventually so so thanks for uh yeah anytime yeah you know where to find me just across the pond turn left just a seven hour delay no big deal <laughs> no problem thanks for watching everybody we'll see you on the next one night everybody see you soon bye thank you for listening to the disconnected podcast there's one big thing that you could do to help the show and that is to leave a rating and review on the podcast service of your choice thank you